Um, I'm Laurie Axman with PCI. Um, welcome to um, the latest monthly speaker series focused on commercialization topics um, around life sciences. And um, I'm really pleased today to welcome a very close partner and expert. But before I introduce her, I wanted to highlight the fact that um, in the chat, there's a link to our upcoming celebration of innovation, which is um, an event we do annually to kind of highlight um, all the faculty at Penn who received patents um, in our last fiscal year, which um, at Penn, given our, um, I would say, innovative faculty is always at least over 100. And also we give out um, um, some special awards around um, to highlight commercialization achievements. And um, so it's, it's a great moment to come and support the innovation activity at Penn. So all are welcome. And, um, but today I'm really glad to welcome Catherine Doyle, who's a partner at Saul Ewing and um, has a long career uh, around life sciences and in particular issues related to intellectual property. Um, she works very closely with a number of our faculty who um, are prolific inventors on these issues and always provides a lot of insight about trends and issues she sees. So um, happy to hand it over to Catherine. And also um, if, if you want to um, ask a question, feel free to put a question in the chat and, or, you know, we could save it for the end, whatever you prefer, Catherine, but we'd like this to be as much of a discussion as possible. Okay, great. Well, thanks so much, Laurie. Thanks for inviting me back. And it's really great to be here again, even though I'm in the same room I was last year. <laughs> I didn't go anywhere and I don't think you guys did either. Um, I, I wanted to, uh, I'm looking around at the screen and I see some folks I recognize and others not. And I, when we do this, this talk every year, part of the talk is sort of some of the basics of, of patents and, and what they are and what they do. And then we launch into uh, things that are coming up in the courts that turn our heads sometimes around what you can or can't get as, as a patent claim or an issued patent. So bear with me while I walk you through some basics and then we'll get into those sort of trends. The, the thing I'd like you to do, I'm not gonna be able to see the screen once I start screen sharing, uh, but if you have a question, put it in the chat, please interrupt me. You know, just hit your on mute button and ask the question. It's not going to bother me. And I'd really rather address any issues you have straight up front uh, rather than waiting till the end, because by then you might have forgotten where we are. And if you have a question, somebody else probably does as well. So uh, don't be shy. And no question is too simple or too rudimentary. Um, we're just here to learn what we can from, from this process. So with that, I'm going to share my screen and start the slides, I think. There we go. Um, and then stop me if you have a question or put it in the chat or tell Laurie or just unmute and uh, we'll see where we go. So um, what we wanna sort of talk about in general today is what types of patent claims are possible that you can get in a patent, as well as ones that you can defend under the current federal circuit law. The two places where the federal circuit is very active at the moment is in what we call the written description requirement, which I'll explain to you in a minute, and then patent eligible subject matter. Oh, and, and the second thing I'm gonna do, well, let me just, so the second piece to this is something that we do a lot of work with you all on, and we do a lot of work with many of our other clients, which is defining who is or is not an inventor. And that's always something I include in here because it literally comes up every single time we file a patent application, figuring out who those inventors are. Sometimes it's really easy, sometimes it's a little harder. And I'm gonna to talk to you a little about some new law that helps us define that um, actually more broadly. So when, when I'm talking about written description requirement, I'm gonna focus on antibodies and cars. 
because that's where a lot of my life is. And I think maybe if it's not where a lot of your life is, it's what you hear banging around uh, Pen Med for sure. And it should be sort of easier subject matter to get your arms around. Not only that, but the two most critical cases that have been uh, decided by the federal circuit focus on antibodies and cars and, and really do inform how we should think about getting patents. The patent eligible subject matter issue comes up in diagnostic claims. It's a real uh, thorn in our sides after some cases were decided quite some time back. And there really isn't any changes in that, but I wanna highlight it for you because it doesn't seem fair. I don't think it's fair. And uh, I wish the court would take it up or actually I wish the legislature would take it up so that we could have uh, a better sense of patentability of diagnostic claims. And then inventorship we'll, we'll talk about. So with that, patent application, just to start. It's a big disclosure, looks like a grant application, has text, figures, tables, and it has an awful lot of words and some of them are repetitive, but it basically has to disclose the entire invention. And then very importantly in the legal terms, the manner of making and using it. At the end of the patent application are these numbered paragraphs called the claims. And these claims are a very precise recitation of the invention. They have their one sentence with, num you know, and each sentence is numbered and they are what everybody fights over. So if you think about defining the invention in a box, the box is made up of words and that's what the inventor believes they have invented. And the claims then become the real sort of things you fight over. An issued patent looks like this. This is uh, one by Brenchens, which is an immunotherapy car patent. It issued on November 13, uh, 2018. And it has a whole bunch of identifying information on the front. It has a lot of what would have been published before this invention was filed, this application was filed. It has an abstract. Behind this, it has, you know, between, I don't remember now, but, you know, 50 and 100 pages of words that describe what the invention is and how to make and use it. And then at the bottom, you have these claims. And these are the numbered paragraphs, which become so important. So if you look at the claims of this patent, claim one is an immunoresponsive cell comprising, meaning the cell has among other things within it, a car that binds to ROR1 and an intracellular intrasignaling domain of CD3 zeta and an intracellular signaling domain of a co-stimulatory receptor and a nucleic acid encoding a recombinant CD40 ligand. That is the box around which Brentgens and his colleagues believed they were entitled to this invention. Claim two, if you look at it, further defines claim one. It says the cell, the immunoresponsive cell of claim one, wherein the nucleic acid is comprised in a vector. So now if claim two stands, but claim one falls, the nucleic acid has to be in a vector, okay? Three depends from two. So you see what we're doing. We're sort of narrowing down what the invention is, describing it. Three then is the cell of two, wherein the vector is a viral vector. It's not a plasmid, it's not something else. It's, a, it's actually a viral vector. And four then depends from three, wherein the vector is a retroviral vector. So it's not an adenovirus or an adeno-associated virus or a herpes virus, it's a retroviral vector. So you kind of get the gist of this. The examiner, when the examiner examined this, decided this claim, claim one, was what should issue. And, and it for all of its breadth, so it's a car that must bind to R01 and has to have CD3 zeta, has to have an intracellular signaling domain of a co-stimulatory receptor. That's a very broad term, right? We know that that could be, if you look down on claim eight, CD28, 41BB or OX40. But up here, that broad claim says it can be any one of them. So we call that a genus feature. 
And down here in claim eight, we call this a species feature. And then it has to have a nucleic acid encoding recombinant CD40 ligand. So when we write these things, we ask the inventors to really define in the broadest terms what, what they think the invention is. And then more narrowly, what kind of, we get down almost to exactly where the experimental data are in some cases, but the broadest claim is the one we fight the hardest for. Now, this is a sort of an analogy that is much more simple to kind of think about. So a chair has never been invented and you have now come up with a chair and it has a seat, a back attached to one end of the seat and legs that support the seat. And if you think about it, that's any chair. It's a swivel chair, it's a bench, it's a four-legged chair, a three-legged stool. It's, it's, it's all kinds of different ways that you would support sitting. But claim two then says it has to have four legs. So now if claim two is the only claim that, that remains, if, if there's a challenge here, the infringer has to infringe using a chair with four legs that has a seat and a back and, and legs that support the seat, but there has to be four legs. Claim three then would define that the seat's made of wood and four would say that this, the back is made of leather. So during examination, where a patent examiner looks at the scope of your claims to see whether or not they're patentable, the examiner may find publications or prior art, as we call it, that will negate patentability of claim one, but say, I don't see any prior art where claim two is, claim two is patentable, but not as it's written. So what we do is we amend the claims where now claim one integrates the word four legs into it and claim two is canceled. So now the infringer would infringe if, if they only if they had a chair with four legs. So if you go back up to Frenchens here, at some point the patent examiner decided this is in fact allowable, but it could be that if this patent was challenged as being too broad, the patent holder may have to go back and rely on claim eight wherein the co-stimulatory receptor is any one of these three, CD2841 BB or OX40, okay? Any questions on that? All righty. So, so the claims are what define the application, but, and, and the, the courts have very specific ways of figuring out what the claims mean. The broadest reasonable interpretation the plain meaning, what the words actually say, and then other things like in the disclosure or what we call the specification, the big sort of 100 pages, provide clues and meanings. The claims are assessed by the examiner to see if they satisfy the patentability criteria as defined in the statute, which is 35 USC, okay? And the claims have to have utility, they have to be useful. So a, a perpetual motion machine is not a patentable thing. Uh, and they have to be non-natural. They can't be found in nature. They have to be novel, meaning they're not out there in the public domain in the identical way as we've claimed them. They have to be non-obvious. And this is the thing we fight with the examiners the most about because non-obviousness changes over time as technology becomes more and more sophisticated. What might have been a big step from one place to another, from what was published to what you've now invented, as technology improves, becomes a baby step. And then they have to be enabled. This is an interesting sort of piece of the law where it says you have to teach in this sort of big wad of words you file, that they, the reader could make and use. And then the last one, which we're going to focus on a bit today, is they have to satisfy the written description requirement, which means not only do you have to show somebody how to make and use, which is enablement, you have to actually tell them what it is. 
And when you get to antibodies and you get to cars and you get to other things, you're talking about chemical structure, not what it does, what it is. And that's that's the place where the courts have been most active quite recently. The examiner that's looking at these in the initial stages after you file is someone with a PhD, generally someone who knows a lot of immunology. Occasionally we get belligerent examiners who are, you know, sort of very dug in in their view of the law. Most of them are very helpful. Many of them have been in the position of some of you on the screen here. They've done PhDs, postdocs, and then they say, well, I'm not, I don't want to go forward in academic life and I think I'll become a patent examiner. And they're trained up in elements of the law. So we work with an examiner back and forth to look at the scope of the claims we first file, amend them if we need to, and then the patent is issued provided we satisfy generally in, in broad terms all of these criteria, okay? When there's a publication before we file, that would be what we call prior art. And prior art might be that you publish your whole invention in its entirety and now you destroy novelty of your invention. Or it could be obviousness where the examiner will say, two other references combined produce your invention and therefore you're not entitled to it. Or even one reference. And it could be one of your own or it could be someone else. So a public disclosure that hurts your patentability could be a scientific article, the most common, could be a thesis, which is available and cataloged and someone can get it. Can be an abstract, which describes sufficient data in a poster or a talk that gives away the invention. Can even be an abstract of a grant if it gives away enough because they're published once the grant is awarded. Any kind of oral public talk or poster, which is open to people outside of your own institution. Any funding partner pitches that you give to people where you're trying to start a company or get funding for your, your research that isn't given under what we call a confidentiality agreement or a CDA. So when you think up an invention, what we always want you to do is go to your uh, folks in PCI over at Penn, fill out the online disclosure, talk to them and make sure you don't do any of these things before they file, you know, if they decide to file and get a patent attorney involved and then they do file. After the filing has taken place, these things are no longer fair game to negate patentability of your invention. So this part becomes very important for academic scientists because, you know, you're supposed to talk about your stuff. You're supposed to publish it. You're supposed to get funds for it. So there's a bit of a tension here around trying to file before you publish. And I will tell you that nobody will ever tell you not to publish. Nobody will ever tell you not to talk. What they'll say is, can you give us a couple of days just to, to see if we can get something on file if we're in a rush? And if not, you know, we'll comfortably prepare an application and file it. And then you can do all, all the disclosures you need to. Um, yes, Vivian. Um, question. Can I consider uh, the submission of a grant, so the text of the grant, as a disclosure? Great question. And the answer is the, the submission of a grant application is supposed to be published, or I'm sorry, is supposed to be confidential. So it's not seen and it can't be retrieved by anybody from, you know, outside of that confidential sphere. The fact is, though, in reality, PIs get grants to review, they're on study sections, and they hand them to their postdocs who may run down the hall and talk to another postdoc. <laughs> so we try to file before the grant's submitted, but if we don't file before it's submitted, it's still not a public disclosure unless someone comes up years later and says, oh, I knew about that because here's why. Because mm -hmm. somebody gave it to me and they broke confidentiality. But they are technically not public disclosures. Now, and, foundations yeah. may put the grant application up online mm -hmm. before they award the grant, so you need to be worried about that. The government grants are confidential. 
Thank you. Any more? No, you're good? I'm good. Okay. Timeline for filing, you know, this is just sort of jargon that, that we sort of engage in. You file, usually the first application is called a provisional. It's a way of getting the invention down and filed, securing a date behind which, earlier than which, any prior arts fair game, but after which it's not. Um, and then one year from that, but that provisional is not examined by an examiner. And one year from that filing date, we file in the PCT. Um, oops, I'm sorry. And that's an international filing that allows you to preserve all rights to file in foreign countries. 30 months later, after filing the provisional, you can go into all these countries, and then you can potentially have issued patents in lots of jurisdictions around the globe. Most universities will file a PCT, even if the invention is not licensed yet. But when it comes to this 30 month filing in multiple countries, many universities will not file broadly, globally, unless they have already got a licensee uh, on deck who will underwrite those costs. Because the actual fact of the matter is that filing at this deadline in all these multiple countries can be hundreds of thousands of dollars in filing fees and translation fees. And that's a huge investment by any university where there isn't an underlying sort of supporter of the invention. Um, so the goal is to file a really good provisional. And then the really the, the great folks over at PCI, including Vivian, who's on here, and uh, I think I saw Benning as well. There may be others by now. Those folks then go out and try to market this so that you can get partners. So that when you hit this 30 month deadline, hopefully you have a licensee and, and then the university goes forward and files more globally. So let's just talk quickly about utility, natural, non-natural. Can't be a natural thing. There's, there's law now for quite some years that says nucleic acids, proteins, antibodies, anything produced normally in the body is not patentable. The other thing that's not patentable is looking and seeing. So a diagnostic test that relies on just, you know, I looked, I saw, and therefore this person has that disease. That's called mental steps by the patent office and by the federal circuit. So you have to look, see, and do something. Those claims would be patentable. So a lot of diagnostic patents right now, what you'll see is a method of treating cancer in a subject comprising looking to see and when you see, you provide the treatment. Those are the kinds of ways we try to get around the, the diagnostic dilemma. Novelty, we've talked about. Non-obviousness, when, when there's a reference that the examiner says makes it obvious, we will often argue back that reading that reference, there's no motivation to come up with the invention. No likelihood of success, no, the, the whole invention's not there. Others tried and failed. We have unexpected results. All of these things are arguments we make against obviousness. Enablement, and this is why the patent applications are really fat. Um, when I first started, we didn't have electronic filing. That'll tell you I'm dating myself, but um, my, my first mentor used to say to me, we weigh them before we, we mail them in. If they're not hefty enough. We haven't used enough words. Therefore, we didn't teach properly how to make and use. And, and as I say, these things are really, for, for the uninitiated, initiated, these are murder to read because they tend to be so repetitive. Um, but you have to teach every which way and yon how to make and use the scope of that main claim. And then the written description where you have to actually identify what the thing is in the document itself. And then a patent examiner examines it, makes a ruling based upon what they see in the disclosure and what is claimed. So let's talk about antibodies in written description. They have to be non-natural, novel, non-obvious, written description enablement. The, the complications in this are that for antibodies, because the variable region was so different from one antibody to another, the courts 
granted kind of an exception to what it is rule where the court said if and these are all just the antibodies which you know uh, could be could be available the court said if the antigen to which the antibody is binding is new never known before you can get a claim for the antibody that binds to that antigen so in other words you didn't have to know the structure of the antibody you just had to know what it was binding to provided that thing it was binding to was itself new in the in the art that was the old law and the reason that existed was because as i said the variable region was so difficult to define by sequence what happened recently is in amgen v sanofi in 2017 the court there said you can no longer claim a monoclonal antibody by function so the claim in amgen v sanofi was an isolated monoclonal antibody I keep doing that an isolated monoclonal antibody were in when bound to PCSK9, it bind to at least one of the following residues and then blocks binding of PCSK9 to LDLR. Okay. Nothing in the patent application or the issued patent said what the composition of the antibody itself was. Okay. Under the old law, Amgen arguably satisfied this newly characterized antigen test where the antigen itself was new for this function. And then they were all arguing with each other about whether Sanofi infringed Amgen's patent. So the way this arose to the federal circuit is uh, Sanofi sold their antibody preluent and Amgen said, you're infringing our patent. Sanofi counterclaimed in the lawsuit that Amgen's patent was invalid. And that's what this argument is about. The claims are invalid because you don't tell us what the antibody is. You only tell us what it does. And in that Federal Circuit decision, the court said, not only did you not tell us what it is, you didn't even give us a whole bunch of antibodies to be sort of globally in possession of any antibody that binds this antigen. And the newly characterized antigen test no longer satisfies the written description requirement. Very recently, like about two weeks ago, the Supreme Court decided to pick this case up and actually deal with it, which is really unusual because the Supreme Court very rarely weighs in on patent matters. And I'm not sure I know why they picked this one up, but they have. And now we'll see what they have to say about it. Um, so antibodies no longer can be claimed based on function. They must be claimed based on structure. And when I think structure, I think of the sequences of the CDRs the sequences of the variable and light chains, the, the heavy and light chains, but that's new. The reason this has come about is the technology progressed to a place where it became easy to sequence antibodies and sequence a lot of them all at once and be able to have broad claims to an antibody, provide a bunch of sequences and say, see, I tell you what, five of these are, you need to give me any antibody that now will bind to this antigen. And that's what the federal circuit's saying. And we'll see what the Supreme Court decides about it. So you have to now, if, if you find some really great antibodies that you think are going to be the next Enbrel or something, you have to produce the sequence, particularly the CDRs, and you have to produce several of them for several different species of that antibody. Okay. This one, this, this next case is one that's fun um, for, from where we all sit, because this is Juno and Kite, um, who are, you know, major rivals uh, to Novartis and in Novartis's license of Penn's CAR T-cell technology. So Penn's not involved in this case at all. 
but it is one that that I've been watching for years because how this fared would would tell us how well our patents uh, are going to fare if challenged uh, on on CAR T cells themselves. So the issue here is this is an older patent that was filed by uh, actually I think it's St Jude or Memorial Sloan Kettering. So Juno licensed Sloan Kettering's uh, patent. Juno got claims that issued. And Juno said to Kite, who's selling Yescarta, which is the second approved CAR T-cell product in this country, uh, Kim Raya that, that Penn was involved in was the first. Um, Juno charged Kite with infringement. The district court said that Kite was infringing. And the district court said that Kite owed Juno $1.2 billion. This is not chump change in anybody's book, not even Elon Musk's right now, right? So Kite appealed and the federal circuit weighed in and said that Juno's patent was invalid, thereby reversing the entire 1.2 million. So big high stakes here. So the issue was just as before. So Juno sues Kite for infringement. Kite countersues and says Juno's patent is invalid. District court says Juno's patent is valid. Federal circuit comes in and says, oh no, it's not. And so the issue is the validity of Juno's claims to a nucleic acid encoding a CAR T cell receptor comprising an intracellular domain of CD3 zeta signaling domain and a binding element that interacts with a selected target. That's a really broad phrase. I can't highlight this. I don't know why. A binding element that interacts with a select target is a hugely broad phrase. That could be anything. So independent claims, remember our little cone? Um, the binding element is a single chain antibody and it binds to CD19. Okay. Juno alleged that Kite's, so we went through this. They alleged Kite's Yascardo product uh, infringed. Kite countersued that Juno was invalid. And then the federal circuit claim said that Juno's claims were invalid because the patent didn't have a single nucleic acid sequence or amino acid sequence for any single chain antibody, let alone any CD19 single chain antibody. Not a single thing. You can look at this patent and there's not a blessed thing in there that tells you what the structure of that binding element is. So, Juno's claims at the district court level were considered to call to cover all single chain antibodies, and yet not one of them had a CD19 uh, sequence in there. And, and this one's kind of interesting because they asked the Supreme Court to uh, pick up the case, um, Juno did. And on November 7th, just literally 10 days ago, the Supreme Court said, nah, we're not going to. And I'm actually fascinated by why they picked up the Sanofi case and they didn't pick up this case. Um, I would have picked up this one, but I guess uh, CAR T cells kind of go beyond their brains. I don't know, sophisticated technology. They'll probably just pass and wait till the next case comes up. So today the law is when you file a CAR T cell patent, you really have to show the sequence of the binding element in the CAR T cell. And if you don't, you're, you're not going to be valid. And even if a patent examiner allows those claims, you should know that those claims will be vulnerable to attack if the sequences aren't there. So Catherine. Okay, <laughs> go ahead. The, the, can you go back? I mean, this case was filed like in early 2000. So we before 2017 decision. And so it was issued and there was no need at the time of providing sequences. Now right. we are 2022 and we say, well, you haven't done so, so your patent is invalid. They may have been in possession of those sequences, but for competitive reason, they did not incorporate that likely, I'm assuming. So it's, it seems easy 
to revisit the past with new rulings, right? Uh, so how do you, how can one be prepared uh, for the future, <laughs> basically? Well, that's the thing. I mean, when when you're you're actually right, when this patent application was filed, there was no such requirement to show the binding element by sequence, right? It was there were no such requirement um, to for antibodies to be defined by sequence if if the antigen being found being bound to was novel. Here, though, even under the old law, the antigen being bound, the antigen that they were binding their antibody within the CAR-2 mm -hmm. was not a new antigen. CD19 was known for years, yeah. Yeah. right? Yeah. So in some respects, okay. these guys were, you know, they were messing up. Mm -hmm. The sequence of CD19 was available when that patent application was filed. And they chose not to put it in because they thought that the idea that they incorporated it into a CAR T cell structure would negate the need mm -hmm. for the would negate the need for adding the sequence in. So I don't know why the patent attorneys didn't add it in. I do know that for all of us that are in the front end of prosecution, when we're filing patent applications, we try to predict down the future what might be required. Mm -hmm. And this is why these documents get so sort of fat and big because we don't know how the court's going to rule. It is the case for people who study the federal circuit and certainly the Supreme Court, it is the case that both courts have been moving to a much more patent-unfriendly scenario where narrower and narrower claims are what they will allow to stand, but broad claims will not be allowed to stand. And that's true. That, that, that trend has been going on now for nearly 20 years. So there's a sort of a anti-patent stand by the Supreme Court. I'll be curious with this court that we have now, the six conservatives, how they'll rule on this because they're much more pro-business than a more liberal court is. You know, the liberal court wanted to open the door for much more generics and biologics and not have monopolies. And I would imagine the conser more conservative court will want to broaden out uh, more what claims you know, the broader scope of claims to protect sort of the brand businesses. So we'll see. Okay. But it always Thanks. swings, you know, it goes like this. Yes, I know. <laughs> yeah, we do. Yeah. In, in a whole lot of other areas too. Not the subject of today's talk, right? Um, but a great question. So yeah, you can retroact, the, the, the law applies retroactively. So I had a client call me up they had a license to a diagnostic patent that's no longer valid, but the license was still in place. And the licensee said, I don't have to pay you on the license because according to the court, you're no longer, your claims are no longer valid. And we said, well, yeah, that might be true, but they had this patent itself has not been proved to be invalid in a court. And unless you want to sue us to invalidate the patent, you still owe us on the license. So we ended up renegotiating the license. So we dropped the royalties way down. Mm -hmm. But nonetheless, it is true that a whole ton of patents in the diagnostic area instantly became sort of vulnerable to invalidation. Um, and now some CAR T cell patents will also become vulnerable to invalidation because sequences weren't pre presented. Thank you. Unless the Supreme Court turns this around, which would be fun. Would be good, yes especially yeah. for the diagnostic field. But. Right. <laughs> I always think of, of, you know, when the court swings like this, it's like, um, you know, uh, it's, it's uh, what is it called? Uh, job security for lawyers, you know, as <laughs> we just have to keep running back and forth. So it's good business to be in. Um, I know we're, we're, we're running close to uh, the, near the, the, 45 minutes in, and I want to talk about inventorship as well. So forgive me, I'm going to rush through this part a little bit. And if anybody has questions afterwards, you know, you can always reach out to me or we can talk after the talk is done. But this new and useful piece is very important. The unpatentable subject matter, laws of nature, products of nature, 
mathematical algorithms, mental processes, looking and seeing, as I said. Um, and I and that then affects the diagnostic industry where detecting and looking and seeing is not eligible, but you can couple detecting and looking with treatment. So a claim might look like, an ineligible claim would look like this, where you're looking to see if the person has rheumatoid arthritis, you look to see, you determine, you measure against some control. And then when it's twofold greater, the person has RA. Big whoop, says the, the patent examiner and the courts, that's not eligible. You can't get a patent. But you can maybe get a patent on a method of treating RA where you look, you see, and then when you see it, you give the patient an anti-RA treatment. Might be obvious, might not be obvious, depending upon the looking and seeing, but at least now you have sort of an active step of a human. That's kind of what they, they insist on. Okay. Um, let's go to inventorship because I know this is a really important topic in any sphere, but especially in universities where there's so much collaboration going on amongst yourselves, as well as with other university faculty outside of Penn, as well as with companies that sponsor work that you might be doing and so on. So this whole thing gets gets to be very important. You have to name the right inventors on a patent application or a patent, but if you name the wrong ones, you can fix it provided there was no deceptive intent. And why would there be deceptive intent? Let's say Vivian and I invent something together and Vivian says to me, look, it's easier if you stay off this patent because we're gonna have to share royalties with your company. So I say, oh, okay, I just won't be named as an inventor. Vivian gets all the money and then shares it with me be sort of as a sidebar. That's deceptive. So if Vivian and I invent something together, we both have to be named if we're truly the inventors. Um, if we get it wrong though, and Vivian thinks I'm not an inventor, she thinks I'm a little bit of an idiot. She, I didn't really contribute a whole lot, right, Vivian? Um, <laughs> then, then we can, you know, say, well, Vivian didn't maybe know what an inventor was. Vivian was was unclear, and once we looked at it more carefully, Catherine should be added. So you can correct this anytime during the pendency of the patent application before it issues or even during the enforcement term of the patent while it is still enforceable. It's a legal determination, not a moral decision. Um, so what that means is it's not sort of like adding people on papers. So you have your first author that did a whole lot of work. You have your last author who funded the lab, maybe came up with all the ideas. And you have a slew of people in the middle that really contributed meaningful data to whatever is published in that article. That's how authorship is done. For inventorship, it's whoever came up with the ideas. It's not the people who just did the work. And here's why it's really important. In the US, ownership resides solely with the inventors, unless and until they assign that invention to another. Under Penn's patent policy and every major university in this country, if you are employed by the university, you agree that your inventions will be assigned to the university. In return, the university will give you some percent of the profits from that uh, invention, provided there are any. That's the way the system works. It's been working since the beginning of Baidol back in the 80s. So ownership resides solely in the name of the inventors unless and until the inventors assigned to someone else, okay? So here, you're an inventor, Vivian, you assign to Penn, Penn is now the owner. You collaborate with me, I work in the University of Jiblip, I assign to the University of Jiblip, and now Penn and Jiblip are co-owners, okay? So, if Penn owns part of the invention and Jablip owns the other part, you now have two co-owners. Change the, the, the hypo and instead of Penn and University of Jablip, Penn and a company own it. And the company wants to run with it, but Penn is a co-owner. And every owner that's a co-owner has an undivided interest in the whole. So 
there have to be agreements between these owners as to how everything is distributed and even how patent prosecution is being handled because each co-owner has an undivided interest in the whole. So when you have joint inventorship, you have joint, you, you potentially often have joint ownership if the two inventors came from different places. What is an invention? It's conception. It's this idea of a complete and operative invention, including every feature of the subject matter sought to be patented. So I can sit back here in my lovely study and I can think up something and I can think of every feature of the subject matter sought to be patented. I know exactly what it is. And I run off to Vivian and I say, can you do all this work and see if this thing works? Because I'm pretty sure it's going to. Here's how the experiment should be designed. Vivian runs up off and does all the work. I'm the sole inventor because she didn't come up with the idea. But if Vivian in running off and doing all the work comes back to me and says, Catherine, this is not gonna work this way. You're gonna have to do it that way. And it won't bind to this, but it will bind to that. And that second feature that Vivian came up with makes it into the patent claims. Now Vivian is a co-inventor with me. Even though I came up with the overall general idea, she came up with enough that made it into those claims. So now we have a co-inventorship. If Vivian only did the work, then she's not a co-inventor. So joint inventors don't have to work together at the same time. They don't have to make an equal contribution. They don't have to make a contribution to every one of those long lists of claims, but they must have collaborated. It can't be just sort of coincidental that they came up with it each on their own. And what happens? Collaborations don't go well. One group begins a project, another one takes it over. Where did that happen? Who invented which part? Uh, what happens when a cell is used for one use is discovered to have a different use by a different party? All kinds of problems. So very recently, and this was two years ago, the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute and Ono Pharmaceuticals had a big row about this, went up to the federal circuit, and it's a very long file history here of the, the court case. But basically, the Dana-Farber guys, and, and it all, all involves PD-1 inhibitors for which the main inventor of Ono's patent got the Nobel Prize. So this was kind of big stuff. Here, the, the real interesting thing about this case is that the Dana-Farber guys were working really hard to look at PD-1, PD-L1, and inhibitors of the, those things. They ended up working with uh, Ono's inventor, whose name is just escaping me now. And there was a collaboration between them. And then they all got mad at each other and the collaboration broke down. And then Ono's patent was filed and the Dana-Farber guys were not named. And Dana-Farber sued Ono to get them back onto the patent. And Ono said they shouldn't be on and the federal circuit said they should. And one of the reasons Ono said they shouldn't be on is that a small amount of the invention had actually been published by the Dana-Farber guys before the application was filed. And the court said something like, there's no principal reason to discount genuine contributions made by collaborators because a small portion of that work, work was published. They still contributed to, to conception. And that conception goes on for a long, long time. So if we go back to conception, what if I'm sitting around thinking about some idea and I'm not entirely sure if it's gonna work or not. And I'd start that process today on November 17th, 2022. And I mull it over for a while. And then I talk with Vivian in, I don't know, January of 2023. And then Vivian thinks about it for a while and she goes and talks to Lori Ackman in March of 2023. And then something else happens and something else happens. And then we look to see, finally, we have this bona fide invention in July of 2023. There's this long thread of conception that goes back to today with me, right? And then they contributed bona fide contrib contributions to invention throughout. What the court is saying is you have to go back to where it began and then you have to start that thread from there to do the analysis. So that sort of changes how we think of inventions sometimes when we're looking at inventorship here at Penn and at other places where 
who came up with the idea? When did they come up with it? Do they have proof they came up with it? And then who did they involve in helping sort of bring that to some kind of maturity where we were able to file a patent application? Um, some, you know, when we do these inventorship investigations for you all and for many of our other clients, we do a lot of talking on the phone, asking people these questions about when, where, and why. And then we might look at emails between them all, lab notebooks, notes of meetings they all had to try to sort out where that thread began and, and, and where it sort of came to fruition and then define those people as being the inventors. So it's become a really big issue thanks to the Dana-Farber case just a couple of years ago. And it's incredibly important for, like I said, ownership, and therefore, all the partnering activities that go on around patents, plus, um, you know, the, the sort of, do I get named or do I not, which is very important to faculty, just like authorship on papers. And it also becomes incredibly important around uh, how you go about partnering and developing that invention, bringing it to commercial sort of fruition. And... That's all I have. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen unless somebody wants to see a slide again and just pause and see if there are other questions from anybody. I've got a hand up. Eugene. Hi there. Hi. Hi. Thank you so much for your for your talk. Uh, I have a, I had a question on that follow up case. Wouldn't the publication by the Dana Farber scientists wouldn't that have invalidated the initial grant of the patent or the or the claims? Couldn't the court have found that the claims themselves were invalid? Um, just curious. Yeah, it's funny that so this case was a bit like you know twisting things into a pretzel. Um, the actual publication itself did not negate patentability of the claims in the oddest way that I can think of. It was sort of part of the story, but it didn't, it was never considered to render the claims obvious. And, okay. and Ono was trying to say it did, but it didn't. In the examination of the patentability of those claims, that publication never came up. I see, but it was, it was still sufficient that they could be considered the inventors. That's right. Wow. I know. I mean, that's what we said. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's why I say it's kind of like turning yourself into a pretzel. Okay. Uh, I would say in a rule of thumb, don't publish <laughs> until the application is <laughs> filed. I still hold to that. But I, I, this was a, this was a uh, quite a surprise as a holding. Okay. But because it didn't negate patentability of claims, that's why the court found that way, even though uh, the publication contained part of the conception. I see that. that that's that's very fact intensive as to what that publication said exactly. So yeah. okay. yes, if you read that case, you'll have to read it twice <laughs> to figure out what the facts are. <laughs> thank you. You're welcome, Michael. So, uh, Catherine, thank you for a very clear, very uh, very strong presentation. Uh, two questions for you. Number one. For academic inventions, uh, do you find tr track one filings are worthwhile, useful, interesting for the sort of high priority, uh, simple nutshell type inventions? Yes. Yeah. If you so, so what Michael's referring to is there are different sort of almost, you know, pay to go faster systems within the patent office, one of them being what we call track one. There's another one actually, which is an exception if it's cancer immunotherapy. And the examiner picks them up ahead of patents, patent applications that didn't pay that money to go forward fast. We've done a huge number of track ones. The best way to uh, decide whether you should pay more to go faster is if the invention is fully developed and the claims are discrete and defined. Absolutely. So thank you. And next question, when you when you have a patent examiner who so initially seems amenable to yes, this is this is this is novel, this is not this is inventive, this is you know, and then they sort of start just completely digging in their heels, and it, you get the impression that they just either they completely don't understand the application or they've decided to deny it for whatever reason. 
what are the options available to you when, when you have sort of an obdurate examiner? Yeah, that's that's a great question too, because we do have some. I mean, I have to say most of them are not like that, but some of them are just, they're mind blowing. They get so dug in. So when you have an examiner who repeatedly rejects your claims, they will, um, there's a couple of things we can do. We can try to get the supervising examiner on an interview with the examiner and the supervising examiner should review the file before that interview. And they are now super open to Zoom interviews. So that makes that process easier. There's also a program called the after final program where you file or uh, a pre-appeal where you file a an appeal brief saying you're wrong and here's why. And there now must be two others examining that pre-appeal brief and they decide whether this is appealable and should go forward or whether they go back to the examiner saying you're misapplying the law. Hmm. On very rare occasions, and I've only done this once in my whole many years of practicing, you can ask for the examiner to be removed because they have become so, that they have to be really rude and, and the record has to show that their behavior is outside of the standards of the process. Um, and I've been able to do that once uh, where I think this examiner needed some help and it wasn't my help. They, they needed to go do something. Have you had experience uh, with a face-to-face -face meeting helping to break through roadblocks? We, we used to do an awful lot of that. And, and then the patent office, and it did help a lot. You know, and, and the examiners were always particularly interested in meeting the inventors. So they would ask that the inventor come with them and explain the whole invention. And they loved that. And it'd be a big, long process. But years ago, the patent office opened up all of their examiner sort of um, uh, candidates to being remote, where they would move to D.C. for a three-month training period. And then they were going to be in Kentucky or Kansas or Iowa or someplace. and and then face-to-face -face interviews, they didn't like them at all. You were kind of ticking them off by making them come to DC for the interview. So we started doing a lot of interviews by telephone, which is less effective. And then came the pandemic. And now we do the interviews by Zoom, which is much easier. What I like to do when we're doing them by Zoom is I like to be in the room with the inventor myself. So I can help modulate what the inventor is going to say. Um, and make sure they stay on point. And then the examiner is on a, on a different Zoom. Uh, thank you. That's very Great helpful. question. Um, well, since we've gotten to one o'clock, um, I think I should probably um, uh, usher everyone along. But um, Catherine, thank you so much as always for sharing your, your knowledge and expertise with us. And um, we will circulate um, the slides to everyone who attended after. And um, is it okay if folks reach out to you with questions? Absolutely, always here, okay. okay. Well, thanks again. Um, good to see everyone. And we'll have a new series um, around commercialization starting uh, towards the end of January. So uh, again. Thanks for inviting me, Laurie. Thanks, everybody. And thanks for the questions. Have a good Thanksgiving. Thanks, you too.